Leadership, purpose, service. This is Fulfilling the Dream with Wayman Brett. Well, welcome to Fulfilling the Dream. I'm Wayman Brett. Again, we are very happy to be able to give you the best in stories and motivation and inspiration that will hopefully make your lives even better. We have a special guest on the show today, and you're going to love what he's going to tell us, so I can't wait (laughs) to get into it. M.C. Burton III is a member of the Television Academy in Hollywood. His music can be heard on many TV shows, including America's Next Top Model, Totally T-Boys, Read Between the Lines, West Coast Customs, Overhauling, the History's Channel, the History Channel's Everest Air, Car Crazy, and the hit TV show The Real Husbands of Hollywood, starring Kevin Hart. Additional musical scores from MC are featured in the award-winning 2019 short film High Jab, directed by Aaron Smith Gunn, and Above Ground, directed by Eric Smith Gunn. By the age of eight years old, his love for music was developing rapidly. He taught himself to play guitar, bass, and piano by all by ear. Music melodies and song rearrangements seemed to come to him naturally, and performing original works in front of anyone brought him the most joy. MC's first exposure to public performance came about when he auditioned and landed the supporting role of Pharaoh in the junior high musical Joseph and his Technicolor Coat. In high school, MC was a gifted athlete in both basketball and tennis. He was named first team all state in basketball and was a dream team selection along with Tim McCormick, one of the best five high school basketball players in the state of Michigan. MC was also the all city high school singles tennis champion and as a sophomore. But his desire for music always made its way to the forefront of MC's ambitions. In his senior year of high school, MC auditioned for the musical Carousel. He landed the lead role, which shocked the entire school since he was best known as a blue chip basketball player. The role included a five minute a cappella soliloquy. After examining full ride basketball scholarship from across the country, MC selected the University of Michigan to play basketball, and to advance his education. After attending the University of Michigan, MC made the decision to pursue his musical interests. He decided to open a recording studio from his home in Grand Rapids. With moderate success, MC decided to to relocate to the West Coast in order to pursue his musical aspirations more diligently. MC was discovered in California while seeking permission to use sampled material from Grammy nominee, songwriter and producer, Kashif. The breakthrough moment of M- for MC came when Kashif introduced him to acclaimed television award-winning producer, Kurt Farquhar, and MC began writing, producing, and composing music for film and television. MC, I hope, I hope I did you justice. Who is that guy? Wow. (laughs) You grabbed some things I had totally forgotten about, but thank you. Wayman, what an honor and pleasure to talk with you and see you once again, my friend. Big bro. (laughs) Yeah, it's good to see you too. You too as well. Live, live, and color. So I, uh, I, you know, we had a good conversation last week and uh, we're going to get into a lot of what we discussed, but yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, Tell me, Tell me, how did you make this transition to California just right off the tip? I mean, I know there's a lot to that story, but give us an idea, man. What, you know, what, the, what's it like out there? And what, what? It, you know, it, it came down to a couple of very simple questions. One was, where do I want to follow music on the East Coast or on the West Coast? And so then you start talking about climate and that became a very easy choice to make. So I decided to do it in uh, California. 
but the transition, you know, it had its share of difficulties, leaving family and leaving my hometown and pursuing something that I had no idea was going to pan out or not. So there were, there were reservations, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Big reservations. Your dad, man, your dad was a, was a great athlete at Michigan too. Oh yeah. He, oh, uh, yeah. he was one of the greats and, uh, you know, physician here in town, he I'm sure had high hopes for you and playing at Michigan and all of that. And, and you make the, you make the crazy decision back in the day that was that looked crazy but it doesn't look crazy now <laughs> you're you know as a parent now that i'm one as well you always want the best for your children and um they're you know always going to come up with some cockamamie idea of what they want to do versus what you had in mind for them and sometimes it's too crazy to handle sometimes it's a blessing in disguise yeah. sometimes it can be anything but you know normally kids are are going to make yeah. their own decisions whether we want them to or not yeah. um playing you know at michigan behind you know dad's a historic player there uh that was never an issue for me because by the time i was coming out of high school you know i had drummed up enough uh accolades uh for myself that i wasn't even really concerning you know it wasn't even right. a concern of mine so when i got there i was just like yeah let's play basketball let's do it uh but the tugging at music was always there and there came a point where, unfortunately, because of some of the things that were going on with my family, I made an uh, abrupt and knucklehead decision uh, to actually leave Michigan. And uh, to this day, I'll tell you, being completely honest with you, it's the greatest mistake I've ever made. Mm. But, you know, where I find myself how, how, now, When you say it's the greatest mistake, man, uh, break that down to us. You say the grace, well, that's an interesting comment. Well, education is important. You know, I come from a family that uh, put a lot of emphasis on that. Uh, my mother was a uh, teacher. Um, dad, as you know, is a physician. So education and finishing your schooling was paramount in our family. Yeah. And when I decided to negate that and pursue other things, uh, you know, that didn't always settle well. And even though I was dead set on doing it, there were some tough times for our family to to live through. Yeah. Yeah. How did how did you shake that off, man? How did you get through that? What uh, what enabled you to move move past that? It was as like I didn't really have a choice because it was either pursue what I wanted to do where my love and where my passion was or yeah. to um, do anything else, which would have, you know, in my mind made me fall short of what I was trying to do. My father gave me some great advice once or many times, but one of the, the little tidbits he gave me was, son, you're either going to work hard at what you love to do, or you're either going to work extremely hard at something you hate doing. So wow. the choice is going to be yours. That's great advice. <laughs> it kind of is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and I've passed it on to my son as well. Yeah. So he he loved you. He supported you, Doctor M C Burton. Um, he has done well in life as well, and uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful person. Wonderful human being. The support was definitely there. Um, I don't want to say that it wasn't. It was there, but it was you know difficult for all of us to really say. Eh, Really, that's right. what you really want to do, but yes, right. it it always has been. You probably received a lot of criticism from your friends and uh, from people that you knew. No doubt. Questions um, about what what is going on? What what happened? Uh, if you're referring to when I left Michigan, yeah. um, well, like I uh, mentioned just a moment ago, there was a tough time that my family was going through. My parents were. Um, uh, we're getting a divorce at the time and we, we came from a very close knit family. And so that really caused, um, some anxiety for the children. And it just happened to coincide with a time period that I was not playing well at Michigan. Uh, and I think that had something to do with it. Yeah. And one particular night, I can't remember who we were playing against, but I had a, um, a tough game. 
And dad was the kind of um, father, uh, former athlete that wasn't really interested in, in good games that yeah. I had. He was more interested in correcting the mistakes I was making. And in this particular night, I guess there were, you know, uh, more than he really wanted to see me make. And after the game, we would always go over the notes and that sort of thing. But this particular night, I was I was angry with the family situation. I was angry with myself. I didn't want to hear any critiques or criticisms about my game. And I just decided, you know what, to uh, you know where with all of this. And yeah. um, I'm going to make a decision and I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going to go for what I want to do. Yeah, man. And look at you today <laughs> in spite of all of that. I love oh, when at some of those times and I just say. 18, 19, 20. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, didn't mean to interrupt you there. Uh, yeah, when I made that decision, I think I was around 19 at the time. And, yeah. you know, statistics tell you and medical data tells you that the brain's not even through cooking until about age 25 or 26. That's true. So you couldn't tell me anything differently. Yeah. I, I knew exactly what I was doing. And I said, this is going to be it. And let me go. And if you don't want to, see you later. Yeah. Yeah. So, man, that's got to be tough. You know, going out there, California, even though you were musically inclined, you you had no gigs. You had nothing for <laughs> sure. So how in the heck, you know, how did the heck did you train? How did you make that transition went without? I mean, I'm sure you got a little support from your mom and dad, but I don't think. I, I, I did. After they that. knew that I was going to do this regardless, um, dad said, OK. If this is what you want to do, of course, like anything else, I'm going to support you. And at the time he said, well, if you do want to go out there and, and stay out there permanently, then um, I'm not going to just super finance this trip. But if you want to sell your car and get yourself <laughs> out there, you can do it. And I said, then then that's what I'll do. Uh, so I went out there with, uh, you know, a little bit of cash in my in my pocket and um I was living with a cousin of mine and on my mother's side of the family, we have got a ton of relatives out here. Right. Um, I'm no longer directly in Los Angeles. I'm a little South in Orange County, but a mm -hmm. um, ton of, of relatives on my mother's side. So I stay with one of my cousins and very soon I determined that, yeah, okay, I'm going to have to find myself a job and, and, and have some type of income because if I think I'm just going to go out and, you know, sign yeah. this beautiful record deal, I've got another thing coming. So that's how I actually ended up in the insurance business. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You had, so you, so tell me about that. You were, you had to start from the bottom, right? Were you, were you cleaning uh, the board? <laughs> what were you doing? No room? What, what was the job? Was I, I, I got promoted into the bottom. That's how deeply I started in uh, this particular situation. I ended up doing a lot of these temporary service type of um, employment opportunities that might last a week or two weeks. A long one might be considered, you know, anything longer than two weeks was a, a long commitment. But after doing that for a while, um, the one that landed me in a position of, of um basically gopher at this insurance brokerage firm, Marsh. And my responsibilities at the time were to come into the office early and and set up the meeting conference room. How early were you coming in? Oh, uh, I was coming in anywhere between six and seven in the morning okay. and go in there and set up the conference room, set up coffee, pour coffee, put out danishes and that sort of thing. And um you know, I was like, finally, I was just relieved that there was some consistent yeah. income coming in at the time. Right. So that's where I started there. And uh, you? I was with that company for or in the insurance business uh, a good almost 20 years before I decided to leave. But that's how my start was. Yeah. And I'll never forget one of my responsibilities was uh, making sure that the office was, you know, spick and span clean for the uh, head of office there. Yeah. And sometimes he would beat me into his office. Sometimes I would beat him. But we always had these pleasant conversations. And one day when I was in there, he said to me, MC, 
how would you like to work for the company? And I was like, you know what? Uh, his name was uh, Robert Newhouse, a great, great guy. And I said, um, I don't even know what this company does. All I know is where the coffee maker is <laughs> and the filters <laughs> and where to get the donuts. And he was like, you know, that's okay. I'm going to set you up um, in our property division and um, I'm going to uh, send you to the seminar for a couple of weeks in New York. You'll figure out what this uh, company does. We'll come back, get you started. And how does that sound to you? And I was like, that sounds awesome. So um, that's how I actually stepped in to yeah. uh, the insurance business. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it, that was a great uh, opportunity for you. You got to learn a lot of stuff, man. And and then I'm sure that paved the way f eventually for, for uh, your transition. You began to seek uh your real passion tell me about that how did how did how did that transition from insurance how did you end up getting into the music thing what, what well what happened was you you can probably attest to this you know you you blink your eyes and 10 years will go by if you're you know if you're not paying attention yeah. And that's exactly what happened. You know, I was doing so well within this company. I was like, oh, this is great. This is great. I'm making lots of money. This is, this is, this is awesome. And then tap, tap, tap on the shoulder. Um, MC, do you remember why you came out here? What you really wanted to do? Um, yeah. And I was, I would come home from my apartment during lunchtime and I would see my gear in the corner of the apartment and I'd be like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get back to that one of these days. And the next thing you know, it, um, so much time had passed. And during, uh, the time that I was getting close to making that decision of leaving, yeah, my son was living in Phoenix, Arizona, and he was probably somewhere between 13 and 15 years old. And what his uh, mother and I had decided to do at a certain point in his life was to bring him out here with me so he could get, you know, the father perspective. And uh, this is yeah. how you become a man point of view and live That's with great. me full time. Yeah. So once we made that decision to bring him out uh, with me, uh, and I think he was a sophomore in high school, so um, his sophomore year, three years, sophomore, junior, and senior years, um, to make a, a, a long story just a, a touch shorter, um, he graduated and was, was well on his way. He wanted to go into film school. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're talking the year 2005, I think. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I believe that's when he graduated. And so at that time, again, I had to reflect and go, MC, um, if you're going to do something with this music, you better do it right now or just focus on what you're doing and be the best at this. But the decision needs to be made. And that's when I said, you know what? Okay. Uh, insurance has been very good to me. I've got some money saved up. I am going to jump out of the frying pan into the fire and see if someone wants my music. And but the decision uh, had to be made. The decision had to be made because it kept tugging at me. You know, it was still my first love as far as um, career was concerned. And um, yeah. I had dabbled in it back in Grand Rapids. I had dabbled in it when I first came out in LA, but I had never been able to make the full-time commitment. And wow. this was the time to, to make that decision. Yeah, man. So now you're, interacting with Kevin Hart and who else is out there that you get an opportunity to work with, man. Tell us about what that career is like out there. Well, it can be wonderful and exciting. It can be overwhelming. It can be so in influential uh, in both good and bad areas. So you got to be careful about that. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked with a, a fair amount of people who also provided some great advice. Um, but, you know, you have got to be committed to this thing. Um, and I don't want to say mm -hmm. just entertainment. Um, if you really want to be good at something, you've got to make the commitment to do so. And sometimes that's going to be very uncomfortable. Yeah. I read a quote once that came from someone that said, um, 
if you have a plan B, you weren't serious about plan A. <laughs> so, yeah. And I was like, you know what? That's that a makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But so many of us and yeah. I, I yeah. me too, you know, yeah. said, um, I better make sure B is around, um, you know, just to make myself feel better about it. But yeah, I've worked with some, some good people over the years. Um, what was Kashif like? Kashif was the one that I give a lot of thanks to. Um, Cause God he was rest- really talented. He was really talented. God rest his soul. You better believe it. Um, Grammy nominee several times uh, wrote for people like Whitney Houston and uh, he came from BT express um michael jackson uh just you name it he worked with everybody um right he was such a gifted keyboard player how did you meet him what 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 great story well one day i'm writing and um if you're not familiar with the term loop in music it simply means taking a segment of an already pre-recorded piece and you use that segment and you loop it around and around and around it becomes the basis of of your song right um it's a a very creative way to take uh prior music and bring it into the uh, current environment um it's the way producers have been doing producing music for quite some time but if you decide to do that you need to get permission from the person who wrote the song or their publishing company, whoever owns it, in order to, if you're going to release it. So and I get permission from Kashif. Well, on this particular song I was working on for myself, the loop came from um, Evelyn Champagne King, and oh, the wow. song was the song was called "I'm in Love," and I didn't know at the time that was a great song. That was that a great. Song. I'm in love. Yeah. Ain't no doubt about it. Yeah. So I was like, you know, one of the, um, when I was growing up in, um, uh, I think it was post college, but yeah, that became a big hit. And that was just something that resonated with me for such a long time. So anyway, when I decided to use this loop, I had to go get permission. So I didn't know at that time that Kashif had written it. So I'm doing some research on the internet. I find out that, um, he is responsible for writing and producing the song and that the publishing rights belong to him. So I've got to, get permission from him, find him, locate him and see if he'll, he'll allow me to do that. So I called up his management company. I got that far to find out what the name of his company was. And I called him up and the gentleman I spoke with, can't remember his name now, it escapes me, but um, I tell him what I'm trying to do. And he says, oh, okay, uh, well, let me run this by Kashif and see what he has to say. And then um, I'll get back with you. And I'm thinking, this is pretty cool. You know, his management is, seems like they're taking an interest of what I'm trying to do and let's, yeah. you know, let's see what happens. So yeah. um, the gentleman calls me back and it's very quickly, uh, probably within 48 hours, he calls me back huh. and he's like, uh, yeah, MC, I spoke with Kashif about this and I'm like, oh man, cool, cool, cool. And he says, um, MC, uh, Kashif wants to talk to you about it. And I'm like, what? He, Kashif wants to talk to me about me using his song. And he's like, yeah, he says, give him a call. And I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa. Now I'm going to, I'm going to call Kashif. So anyway, yeah. I call him up and very cool, very cool cat, just down to earth, real spiritual guy, just well grounded. And wow. I'm not sure if you know of um, some of his other accolades, but he was also an author. Um, a lot of um, uh, no, work that he good. did in, um, because he was a um, um, not an orphan, but he was in the system uh, yeah. and moved around a lot. So Lost anyway, her. yeah, yeah. So he says, let's get together. And I suggest let's have lunch. And he says, let's have lunch. So we schedule lunch a few days later. And... Uh, I explained to him what I'm trying to do. And he says, you know what, MC, there's two ways that we can go about doing this. He says, the first way is you can use that loop that you want to, that you want to use. But if you do that, that one, that method is going to be a little bit more costly because I'm going to have to charge you about 25,000 bucks to do that. And I'm like, you know, thinking in the back of my mind, nope, don't have 25 grand to do that. And he says, Uh but there's a, another way 
I can actually replay the song for you. And it's going to sound exactly the same way, but it's not the original. And you're paying for the original if you want to do it that way. But I can make it sound just like it because I did it. And that one, you know, will only cost you like around five or six grand or something like that. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so um, I don't make the decision to do either thing at the time. But, you know, we were enjoying each other's company so much. Yeah. Having lunch, we talked about other things. And then um, at the end of it, he says, well, um, think about what you want to do. And uh, he says, in the meantime, um, send me a, some of your material. I'd love to hear what you're trying to do. And so I'm like, okay, because she's management. They call me back. I call it because she, I'm like, look at these blessings just coming in. You know, I'm like, yeah. this is out of sight. Thank so um, I send him a couple of tracks of mine. And um uh, once again, very quick response. He gets back with me a couple of days later and he says, um, okay, MC, you can decide whatever you want to do, but after hearing your material, I want to talk to you about something else. Oh. And he says, MC, you are a songwriter producer. There is nothing, there is no doubt about it. You are gifted. And I'm like, oh my gosh, coming from wow. Kashif. And I'm like, Oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, this means everything to me. And he says, what I want to do for you, though, is I want to introduce you to a friend of mine who I think you definitely uh, need to know. And his name is Kurt Farquhar. And Kurt is, you know, one of the most accomplished musical television produce producers, you know, that, right. that we have. And so I'll try to keep it a little, even a little shorter. Um, Good. I call. Um, no, no, no. He says, I'm going to put you in touch with Kurt. So then um, I'm like, this is great. This is great. And in a position like mine, people who are not noted and who don't have, um, you know, the connections that you want, sometimes you can be yeah. a headache if you're chasing somebody down too frequently and, you know, we want when we have those desires to get into the mix sometimes when we're trying to to do that and we get in front of somebody mm -hmm. we might become a pest or you know it just it, yeah. it, it's a difficult rope to to walk so i'm like he said that he's going to put me in contact mm -hmm. with uh kurt so i'm not going to call kurt uh, because Kashif said, you know, this. Yeah. So once again, I couldn't believe it. The timing was very short. I get this phone call from Kurt Farquhar. And Kurt says, MC, this is Kurt Farquhar. Um, I got your name from a friend of mine, Kashif. You know who I'm talking about. Um, and he says that I need to hear your material. And I'm like, my head is just uh -huh. exploding. And so he says, hey, I'm in Pasadena. Why don't you um, schedule to come in next week and we'll bring some of your material and we'll talk about it and we'll go from there. So again, and, and this is happening um, not too long after I've made that decision you and I were talking about earlier, you know, yeah. cutting off insurance and going 24-7 yeah. music. Yeah. And so have the meeting with um, Kurt the following week. He hears the material and as we're going through it, you know, he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I feel that. Oh, I can I can place that right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Ooh, MC, I can place that one right now. I can. Wow. So I'm like, okay. He says, all right, this is what we do. We're getting ready to go into production. And this was probably because uh, we do it, we still do it around somewhere between September and October every year. We go into this um, heavy, heavy music production for all the television shows. Yeah. And at the time he says, okay, we're getting ready to go into production in a few weeks. Um, my uh, music coordinator is going to send you out uh, copies of songs or vibes that we're trying to get um, that we want you to use as a guideline. Yeah. to produce some of this music for, you know, television needs that we have coming up. Mm -hmm. So that was um, how I got into television. And I'll take it one step further. It was right at the time where um, Kevin Hart 
was starting his new television series called um, uh, Real Husbands of Hollywood. Yeah. And when Kurt reported to me that, oh, yeah, I'm putting your stuff in Real Husbands of Hollywood. And, you know, he played it like, you know, nothing, you know, because what Kurt has is a staff of independent composers like myself, yeah. uh, probably, you know, 20, 25 of them or so. And then, um, you know, he goes to all of us collectively and then he goes to all of us individually, depending on, you know, what he sees the needs are going to be because we all have different vibes and whatever. Yeah. But we were all cranking out the music for this new television show. And um, hmm. it went so well that um, the show started receiving, um, you know, awards and accomplishments. And I, I too, was um, had the blessing and privilege to have been a recipient of one of those ASCAP Music Television Awards back in uh, 2014. So that's kind of what launched me and, and got my foot into the door. Wow. <laughs> That's quite a story, man. Oh, you, yeah. Because cause your love for music just wouldn't quit. You just, uh, just it, stayed with you. and, and it, it, It's a burning sensation, die. literally. Yeah. And, and you didn't know what was going to happen, but the good Lord, and I know that you uh, have a relationship with our Lord and that really has helped you, I would assume. So um, tell us more a little bit about that. I mean, what what moves you? What what causes you to to be able to uh, make the right decisions? I mean, what what's what's that motivating force behind some of this? I'm going to be honest with you. <clears throat> I'm sure you could see the excitement in my face when I'm talking about music yeah. and the love that I have for it exponentially when we start talking about the word i mean i could talk about the word all day long this is so important to me and i never would have thought you know as a child that it would become this important to me i always knew that there was something special about my relationship with the lord yeah. Because he spent so much time speaking to me as a kid. And I wasn't really aware of what was going on when um, when it was taking place. But now, in retrospect, looking back, it's easy to see that um, not only did he know how much um, it was going to mean to me, I was always fascinated by mm -hmm. biblical stories and the biblical films. My favorite movie of all times is Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. um, I watched that every year. My mother and I used to watch it every Easter. Yeah. And so the word has always resonated with me. But as I became older, it started making more sense to me. Yeah. But only after uh, a selection of churches that I had um, attended to find the one that was the right fit for me. Yeah. Yeah. Now you, you found the right fit and you know that God has your back and, uh, he's with you every step of the way. So anything's possible. Oh, absolutely. I've had my share of pitfalls. Um, it's, I've, I've been fortunate, you know, I came from a very good family, um, uh, both spiritually and economically. And um, so I know I have been blessed, but blessings come in so many different shades and colors and instances and uh, throughout one's life. And I did not realize how good the Lord is until you allow him the chance to show him or for him to show you how good he really is. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of mm -hmm. discovered this, oh, it's probably going on maybe 17 years or so now. Mm -hmm. I started attending a church in LA, uh, Understanding Principles for Better Living. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, Della Reese was the, uh, was the pastor. Della Reese, the, 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 the actress. Mm -hmm. yes. And she started 
really taking the word and showing, um, you know, the congregation and, and her church how it was to be used and applied in your daily lives. Mm-hmm. That started clicking for me. I, I don't know if it, um, how well that's going to click with a, a 15 year old, you know, how the yeah. word is going to work in your life. But, sure. you know, at age 30, 35, you know, you're starting to think, you know, I better look into this a little bit more deeply and see Mm -hmm. if there's advantages I can take. Uh, I I am a Christian. So if I'm missing out on something, maybe I ought to figure out what it is and start using it. Yeah, man. And uh, the the word, I don't do anything without checking in with the word first. Uh, And it's just been the most beneficial thing. And and quickly, I'll just say one of the, uh, well, the church that um, I attend now here in Orange County Mm-hmm. is a Foothill Family Church. And I discovered Pastor Mike Webb from watching uh, Joel Olstein. I'm sure you're familiar with Joel. I know. Yeah, I've seen Joel many times. Yeah, so one, one Sunday I'm, I'm watching uh, Joel, and it so happens that right after Joel came on Pastor Mike Webb, um, a church down here in Orange County uh, that was being televised you know, from a local station in L.A. And I gave it a shot once again. <laughs> like wow. the effect that uh, that Kashif had on me, um, but in a, it, yeah. it just opened up a way of making sure that not only am I getting the word, I understand the word, I'm applying yeah. the word, and expecting right. the results that the Bible says I should be getting. Yeah, and when that formula starts working. Come on. You're unstoppable. Yeah. yeah. You know, a lot of people think that it's all this other stuff that you got to do, that you got to, you know, sell your soul and do all this uncrafty yeah. things yeah. to make yeah. it in life. And uh, it doesn't appear that that's the route that you've taken. It sounds like you have a different pathway, and that path has led to your success. You know, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go. My pathway is, you know, the Lord has blessed me in a lot of areas. He's blessed me athletically. He's blessed me musically. And something that I didn't know he blessed me with was my ability to write. Hmm. And I, my mother was an English teacher. So whenever they're, were English assignments, didn't like them because I knew I was going to get double scrutinized at home and at school. And the writing was just, ah, whatever the assignment was, "Ah, okay, let's just finish it. But, you know, my first song that I ever had written was, I was probably seven years old on the guitar. And there was just something about not only writing music, but writing lyrics as well. So... I didn't know the gift that um, the Lord had given to me as far as using vocabulary and words and writing until you remember the, um, the earthquake in uh, 91. Uh Well, it was so large. And at that time I was in a studio apartment, you know, it was probably maybe, maybe 150 square feet. And one of those beds that came out of the wall, you know, the day bed oh, yeah. kind of thing, or no, not a day bed, but what do you call those? But that one, anyway. And it was early in the morning, somewhere between one and two a.m. And I had only been in L.A. maybe, maybe a month, maybe. Yeah. And. Um, this quake starts happening and it's shaking back and forth. And I'm like, okay, I, I'm pretty sure that's an earthquake and earthquakes usually happen in one of three ways. They're kind of rolly. Yeah. They shift and then they do this bounce up and down. Those are the worst ones that bounce. Well, this one went through all three Mm. and it was so violent that the bed came out of the wall. Mm. Uh, No, that's not true because I was sleeping in the bed. The, the stove from the um, kitchen slid out about a foot. 
Um, I was living in this complex that had Olympic sized swimming pools. If you can imagine taking a pool and shaking out four feet of water, mm. that kind of lets you know. Um, but that thing almost sent me back to Grand Rapids. Mm. But the reason I bring it up is because all I had to eat back then during the time was uh, like these tombstone pizzas that I loved. Uh, they they were really, really tasty to me and they were cheap or whatever. So after the quake, everybody was so scared. No one wanted to go back into their apartments. Everybody was living outside because of the aftershocks. They didn't know what was going to happen. And I remember I didn't have much to eat. And so I threw in this tombstone frozen pizza hmm. and it didn't taste very good. And I was very familiar with tombstones from back in GR. Yeah. And it was the first one that uh, didn't taste so great. So I was like, Where's my pen and paper? So I, I wrote a letter. And this is the point I'm getting to. I wrote a letter uh, to Tombstone. A very nice letter, this, that, and the other. And, you know, I've been a fan for X amount of years. I've been eating them. You were not first here in Los Angeles when I moved out. But now you are here. I'm, I'm, I thank you guys for putting this part of uh, the district that you, uh, that yeah. you serve. But this pizza was lousy. What happened? So... And I remember running it by my mother before I sent it, and, you know, I, the English teacher, of course. And I'm like, mom, does this sound right? And she's like, that's a very good letter, son. Mm -hmm. um, so sent it to Tombstone. Um, it took them about, um, about a month and a half to respond to it. And they sent me this um, huge envelope full of all these free tombstone pizza. So I was in heaven, you know, I was like, I go, man. I'm going to live forever <laughs> off a of pizza. So that was the first idea or inclination yeah. uh, that made me think, you know what? I can write, I can yeah. write. And I read your letter. I read your letter that oh, you sent okay. to Chris, Chris Como. Okay. And I said, this guy can write, <laughs> can write. <laughs> You know, and, and you were talking about the uh, term black versus African-American. And I thought, man, that is a great expose, expose of explaining why black and white are not the terms you should use. And I, I don't want to get into it, but but it's it's just amazing how you were able to put that down and uh, made sense of it. It's unfortunate. I you, you told me about Chris never got back to you. I wish he had of. Yeah, I'm still looking. To take on TV. I'm still looking. I think it should be, and uh, yeah. I, I don't want to veer off too far into that if if you don't want to. But I just think that when we color code people and we start attaching colors to them versus you know where they're from or their ethnicity, we just right. kind of perpetuate you know the racism, and we we don't help it at all. White and black are the furthest two colors yeah. in the spectrum, and we have enough separation in right. our in our world that we right. don't need to do it anymore. So I made a sub uh, um, a conscious um, decision about four years ago that I said I would never yeah. again address yeah. people that look like you and me as black. They would always be African American or of yeah. African de uh, of African descent, and all the other. Yeah. Um, uh, races of people. I just Asian don't think American, Asian American, American Latin American. Yes. Um, it's just, I, I think, think so. it's the right thing to do. It takes a couple of I agree. extra seconds, a couple of extra syllables to say, yeah. but it, I think it's the right thing to do. We would never say, we would never say, right. Hey, we just elected the first yellow president. I know that's a, that's a fact. We would, we would never, never say that. that or red president or whatever, no. but saying, uh, yeah, our first black president rolls off our tongues like it's nothing. Yeah. And if, we, if it's offensive to one group of people, it should be offensive to all of us. And because we are not from a color, well we, are from, we are from um, some geographical location on this earth. That's it. That's it. And we're so all God's children, too. We're, we're all, all God's we're children. all the same. There's only a, a percentage of our blood that's uh, our DNA, rather, that's mm -hmm. different than you need. We're all basically the same. It's yes. A yep. Small percentage pigmentation of our skin. Yeah. Well, man, this has been an awesome interview with you. And I want to ask you something. What do you want your kids 
And then eventually your grandkids. I don't think you have grandkids yet, do you? I do. You I do. just had my first okay. grandchild in oh, October. Congratulations. Congratulations. She was born October 5th. Her name is Callie. Um, and she's gorgeous, of course. Good. Uh, but yes, but thank you for, for saying that. Well, I always ask my guests, what would you want your children, your grandchildren, your family to think of you, you know, down the road, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and what, what, what would you want them to, to know about you as a person? I would want them to know that it is so important that Family is, there's always going to be disagreements in families and we've had our share of, of ours and in, in, in our family and it can be very, very painful. Um, so regardless of how those things go, family is still so very, very, very important. But, mm -hmm. but there is nothing more important than your relationship with the father mm -hmm. and i'm talking about god the father mm -hmm. if you have that relationship intact all the other stuff mm -hmm. will fall in line and that's according to the scripture so i would want my children and i've already expressed this and my son knows this already mm -hmm. um because i tried to trick him the other day this is what i said to him when i said um son now that um you know you've got a daughter and uh things are going to be completely different for you for the rest of your life. Um, how are you, how, how do you prioritize things now? Um, what's the most important thing in your life now? And I'm just waiting for him to say, Cal. And he's like, well, mm, well, you know, my Lord and savior comes first. Yeah. And, I, and I was like, <laughs> I said, so I thought I was going to get you. He's like, what well, on that? He's like, no way, dad, no way. Wonderful. So if well, they, can get well. that, if they can get that, into yeah. their system, into their DNA, that there's nothing that I can't do. And one of the things that we, none of us really grab a hold on to is that our Lord and Savior wants us to be more successful than we ourselves want. Oh man, that is and a fact. You, and if you can grasp that and yes. use that to launch your yes. pathway, yes. Mm -hmm. you're set. Yeah, listen, man, I, I'm, I'm in full agreement with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy that I ran into you at the... Oh, that was um, awesome, wasn't it? And the golf game this past summer mm -hmm. uh, up at Moose Lodge, I think that's what the place yep, was called. And there you were showing up, and then now we're talking on this podcast show. So, man, much love to you, your oh, family. Much love and, to you. Uh, you know, your dad, MC, you tell him. You oh, know, I'm sure he's dad. listening. Shout, Shout out, out to dad. Yes, you, I mean. you talked to your him mom. Well, mm -hmm. tell him. well tell mom him. is no longer with us. We lost her back in okay. 19. Oh, that's all right. Okay. Thank you for that. Sorry, um, sorry to hear that. But, yeah. you know, you, you've, you've got a good family and you can see what happens. I certainly do. Family. I certainly but, do. But, man, blessings to you, man. And Thank and, you, Wayman. Uh, Continue hey, to be bro. <laughs> when are you gonna have me out there to meet Kevin Hart and all these man, my door is always <laughs> open. Always <laughs> open. So you know, I was listening last thing, I was listening to uh, one of your earlier podcasts, and uh, the gentleman um Jim Hackett, uh, one of yeah. your recent and in the intro, you guys started talking about Michigan basketball. Yes. And I was thinking about how our intro would go. And as I was listening, he took my entire intro uh, because this uh, is what I was going to say to you. What was that? It had to be about age 13 or 14 that my dad took me to the first Michigan basketball game I had ever gone to. And it changed me completely the way I saw the world. We walked into Chrysler Arena and back then the arena was jet black but the floor was lit and that's where you guys were playing and you guys were playing marquette just are like jim said that you guys were playing marquette uh, and i'm like how can i wow. bring this up to him now he just had a guest said the exact same thing oh, but i looked goodness. at my dad as soon as we walked in there and i said to him i said dad i am going to play here one day and he looked oh, at me and goodness. said okay um, but yeah, I'll never forget that. So you and Ricky and, and 
Phil and you guys were playing, you know, um, Marquette. And wow, um, man. now was um was uh, Jerome Whitehead playing during during? I those think times? so. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Tatum and those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I couldn't yeah. believe when your guest said the exact yeah, same man. game. I was yeah. like, wow. But yeah, yeah, that changed my life. I said, I am Michigan bound. Well, All God the way, knows, baby. Yeah, go blue, man. And, blue. Uh, blessings to you, man. Always hope much prosperity for you out oh, there. Wait, you know, thank you so much. And the same and, to you. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. You're a great example for people. Thank you, man. Uh, thank you for having that's me. That's nice on you, man. Okay. Much love. Thanks much for love. listening to Fulfilling the Dream with Wayman and Brett. The podcast that gives you courage and confidence to fulfill your dreams. Discover the riveting personal account of Wayman's journey in his book, Fulfilling the Dream, My Path to Leadership and Finding Purpose Through Serving Others, available in print and audiobook. If you haven't done it yet, subscribe to Fulfilling the Dream, wherever you get your podcast. Share this episode with others. If you think you don't know them well enough, do it anyway. Be bold, make a connection. And if you have a powerful story to tell, let us hear it. To get connected, visit fulfillingthedreampodcast.com.